Welcome back everyone, this is Codebills here with another episode on how to create your own programming language and in this episode we are going to be adding in three very important statements and that's the continue, break and return statements. This is the second last episode and in the final episode we will be uh, reading input from files. So the return statement will look something like this, so inside our function we can put return and then the value we are returning and we can also return here without a value if we just want to uh, leave the function early. The break statement can be used inside a for loop, so if there's some condition, for example, we can break early out of the loop. And we can also use the continue statement, so if there's some other condition, we can continue. And what this does is it just moves to the next iteration in the loop and ignores any code after this. So we'll start as usual with updating the lexer, and we just need to add in a few new keyword types. So we'll have return, continue, and break. So now we can move straight on to the parser. So I've come down to the nodes in the parser and we need to create a new node for each statement we've just added. So we'll start with a return node. So in the init method, we just want to take in the node that we will be returning. And we'll also need a position start and position end. So we'll just assign these variables. And that is it for the return node, so now we can create the continue node. This will only take in a position start and position end, we don't need any other arguments. Because there are no other options when we're continuing, we just simply continue and that's it. So we'll once again assign a position start and position end. So finally then we have the break node and that is almost identical to the continue node, so we'll just copy and paste that and change this to a break node. For break we again just simply type in break, there are no other options, so we don't need any other parameters. Now that we've added these new node types, uh, we can update the grammar rules and create those nodes. So what we're going to do is change this statements rule to, instead of look for an expression, we're going to look for a new statement. And a statement can simply be an expression which you've had before, but it can also be a return, continue or break statement. So we can have a return keyword and then we can optionally have an expression after that keyword. We can then have a continue keyword for the continue statement. And finally we can have a break keyword. So that's it for the grammar rules, it's nice and easy so we can now go ahead and update the parser. So we'll come down to the parser class and we will start with the statements method which now needs to look for a statement instead of an expression. So we'll just update this to self.statement and we'll go ahead and do the same thing here. And now we need to create this new statement method. So we'll define statement. We'll create our parse result as usual and also we'll grab the position start which we'll need at the end of the method. So we'll start with looking for the return statement. So we'll check if the current token uh, matches a keyword with the value of return. We can then advance, so result.register advancement and self.advance. And after the return keyword, we have an optional expression, so we'll use the try register method. So we'll set expression equal to result.try register, and we'll call self.expression. So now that we've used try register, we can check if there is no expression. And I'll just scroll down a little bit. And if there's no expression, we just want to reverse what we've advanced. Uh, so we'll take result dot to reverse count. And then finally, we can return a new return node. So we'll pass in the expression we are returning, and this may be none if there is no expression being returned, and later on we will have to detect that and return our own custom null class. So now we want to add an option for the continue statement, so we'll add a new check here for the continue keyword. We will go ahead and advance again. And now we can just do return result.success, and we'll now return a continue node instead. And we can again use this code here to get to position start and position end. The break node is almost identical, so we'll copy this once again, and we'll just paste that, and we will change this to break, and we instead want to return a break node. Okay, so if we don't come across any of these keywords, then we're looking for a normal expression, which we had before. So we'll set expression to a new expression, so we'll just call self.expression. We'll then check if there's any error. So we'll just return result.failure, invalid syntax error, and we want to overwrite uh, the normal expression error, but also add in the options for return, continue, and break. So we'll come down to the expression method, and we'll just copy that error. And we will paste that in here. And we'll add in the options for return, continue, and break. 
So the one last change we have to do in the parser is come over to the if expression and we now want to look for a statement instead of an expression in these three places here. And this allows us to write the one liner if condition then return without having to separate it into another line and then type return like this. And it also allows us to use continue and break. I don't think we really need one liners for this in for and while statements. I don't see any reason why someone would ever do that, but we might as well still add in the option. So we'll change this to statement and we'll do the same thing here. So inside if expression C, I've changed it to a statement. We also have to do the same thing in if expression cases. So I will go ahead and change this to statement. And then we can come into the for expression and here we can change that to statement as well. And then finally inside the while expression, um, we can change it to statement here. Okay, so that is mainly it for the parser. We will have to come back to that in a minute just to do another slight couple of changes. But now we will move on to the interpreter. So we are going to have to refactor the runtime results class. Previously, the runtime result allowed us to have a value or an error. So if we had this code here, this 1 plus 2 would uh, evaluate to the value tree in here and then the variable a would be assigned to that variable. However, if we put something like return 5 in here, which I know it doesn't really make sense to do that, but if we did, we don't want the value 5 to be directly available inside the value property here and we don't want a to get this value 5, instead we want the function to return with the value 5 if we are inside a function. So we're going to add a new function return value uh, property. So when the function return value is assigned, we will keep returning that up the function call chain. And you can call this propagating the value. And once we've reached the function call, then we can move this function return value into the value property. And now that value can be assigned to variable A or uh, whatever else you're doing with it. We also need a loop should continue and loop should create booleans. So we'll just set those to false. So when either of those are set to true, we also want to just propagate that value upwards and halt whatever we are doing. And then the visit for node and visit while node can consume those values and do what they are supposed to do. So either continue to the next iteration or break out of the loop entirely. So what we'll also do is just take this code and move it into its own self.reset method. So we'll create that and paste that in. So this just means we don't have to copy and paste this every time we have to reset those values. So inside the register method, we were previously propagating the error and we now need to also propagate all these other values. So we'll set uh, the function return value and loop should continue. And then finally loop should break. Inside the success method, we are also going to just call the self.reset method. So typically when we assign the value, we want to stop the propagation of all the other values. So we can do that by just calling self.reset. And I don't know why I forgot to do that before with the error, but now we have it. And inside failure, we also want to reset so that the only thing we are sending out is the error. So now we need to create a few new types of success methods because the normal success is a value success. So we are updating the value and then a failure updates the error but now we also want successes for all these other values so we'll start with a success return uh, method so this will take in the value we're returning we'll again reset but this time we are updating the function return value instead so now for success continue uh, there's no need to take in any value so we'll just reset again and this time we'll update the loop should continue property to true and then finally success break we'll reset and we'll set loop should break equal to true and then that is it for uh, the runtime result update so you should remember that previously when we were calling the visit methods we then check for an error and if that was the case we would return so that basically meant we were propagating the error we now want to also do the same thing for any of these values now inside each place we do this we could add each check but that would make it very long so we're going to put this into a new function called should return so we aren't actually finished so all this will do is return the following boolean and this boolean will be a check of if there is an error or there is a function return value or the loop should continue or finally the loop should break so now we're going to have to update everywhere where we uh, check for an error to instead check if we should return
So we can now control F or command F and look for if result.error and we want to change each one of those to result.shouldreturn. So you have to go through them one by one and change each one. Now be careful not to change the if result.error check inside the parser because the parser also has a parse result and this hasn't been changed so we still want to have that check as before. We are only updating the result.error checks for the runtime result inside the interpreter. So I will be back once I have updated all of those. Okay, so that has taken me 45 minutes, actually more like 45 seconds, and I will be right back and I will check what we have to do next. So before we update the interpreter to handle the new statements, we need to quickly update the function definition node and function classes. So inside the function definition node, we were taking in this value called should return null. And previously when we had functions with multiple statements, we decided we weren't going to return any value and instead return null. But now that we have the return keyword, we can now return a value again. So what we are going to do is change the function definition node to have a value called should auto return. What auto returning will mean is that we return the value of the expression without the need for a return statement. So this means we will be looking directly inside the value without having to move the function return value into the value. So inside the function definition node, we'll remove the should return null option and we'll replace that with should auto return. So we can go ahead and copy and paste that and replace it here. And now we need to put in this new value inside the parser. So inside the function definition rule in the parser, we will come down to where we create the function definition node, which will be at the end of the method here. And we will remove the should return null option. And this is a situation where we have multiple statements, so we don't want the auto returning. So we'll go ahead and set that to false. And up here we have another function definition node. And in this case we have the arrow, so we're going to do the auto returning. So we'll replace it with true. We now need to head over to the function class and make this change as well. So we'll change this to should auto return. And inside copy we need to also add this in. So we can almost update the interpreter now, there's just a mistake I made earlier on in this video. So inside the statement method inside the parser, when we were looking for the expression, I said self.register instead of result.register, so please fix that. And if there is no error, we actually have to return the expression, which I also forgot, so just return results.success expression. Git diffing really does help spot those mistakes. Okay, so now we can go into the interpreter and update the function class. So when we check if we should return, we also want to check if the uh, result function return value is equal to none. Normally when there is a function return value, this should return is true and it will result in us returning from the function. But since we are handling the function returning, we want to capture this value and not make it immediately return so that we can move on to the next line. So now we will remove this which we had before, which does the should return null check because we no longer have it done like that. So we'll create a new return value variable. And if we should auto return, then we just want to return this value. So this is just a value of the function expression when we use an arrow. So we'll set the return value to value if that's the case, but otherwise we want the function return value. So this is when we use the return keyword in a multi-line function. We're actually going to change this to else none and then add our uh, function return value. By doing it like this, even if we have an arrow function, if you do not have an auto return value and you still use the return keyword, then it will still move on to this expression and use the function return value. In the case that no return value exists, then we want uh, the value number dot null. So in our result dot success, we can now just return this return value. So now we need to update the for loop and while loop to allow for continue and break statements. So down here where we append the element to the list, Instead of immediately appending that, we're just going to assign that to a value variable. So we will only add this value if we are not continuing or breaking. So again, we want to capture the value of whether we should continue or whether we should break. So we don't want to return out of this function immediately in this condition. So we can fix this by checking if loop should continue is equal to false and the loop should break is equal to false. So if the loop should continue or break, then this if statement will fail and it will continue executing the code which we will add here. So now all we have to do is check if the loop should continue and we can just simply use the Python continue keyword and we can do the same thing for loop should break and now we can just use the Python break keyword. So if we are not continuing or breaking then we can finally append that value to the elements list. 
So now we also need to update the while node. So again, we won't update the elements list immediately. We'll just assign that to the value variable. We again need to update the should return if statement with the loop should continue and loop should break checks. So this will once again allow us to check these variables now and continue our break if we need to. So finally then we can append a value and that is now it for the while node. So we're about to create the visit continue visit break and visit return node methods. So we just need to quickly come into the visit function definition node method and when we create our function instance we need to pass in this new should auto return variable instead of should return null which I forgot to do earlier. So now we can come to the end of the interpreter and add in these new methods and they are very simple. So we'll start with the visit return node method. We need our runtime result as usual. And we may or may not be returning a node, we might just not be returning anything, so we'll check if there is a node to return. If so, we want to evaluate the value of this node to return, so we'll just register and we'll call self.visit node.node to return. We'll pass in the node and context. And this is the node here, so actually I don't need to pass in the node. So now we'll check if we should return, which used to be just checking for errors, but now we're checking for other situations too. If there is no node that we are returning, then we can just set the value to number.null. And actually I don't think that's even entirely necessary because we already did that check a minute ago. So that doesn't really matter that much, so we can just uh, return result.success. But instead of the normal result.success, we now want .success underscore return. So that will then propagate that return value up and then the function execute method will then take that value and return it. So now we can move on to the visit continue node. So all we have to do is create a runtime result and call success underscore continue. And we can just return that runtime result. So we can copy and paste this and do the same thing for break. So we're visiting the break node and we want to call success underscore break. So those will propagate the fact that we should be continuing and breaking and then the for node and while node visit methods will then take those values and then continue and break respectively. Okay, so that should be it now so we can run the program. So we'll call python tree shell.py. So what we'll do is we'll create a multi-line function. So we'll put in a new line and we'll create a variable called foo that will be equal to five and then we will return the value of foo and we will end the function. So now we have our function called test and if we run this we will get the value of five. So now we'll test out the for loop. So we'll create a variable called a which will be an empty list. We'll create a for loop from zero to 10. What we're going to do is check if i is equal to four then we want to continue. So this means when i is four then that will be ignored. And then we'll do an elif if i is equal to uh, eight then we want to uh, break out of the loop. So this means anything eight or higher will also be ignored. So if we are not continuing our breaking, then we're just going to add this number to the list. So we'll set the list A to be whatever is currently in the list plus the, the number I. So we can then just end that for a loop. So as you can see now, if we look at the variable A, as you can see the number 4 has been skipped, so there is no 4 in this list. And everything 8 and higher has also been skipped, so there is no uh, number 8 or higher. So now we'll test out the same thing for a while loop. So we'll again create a list called A. We'll create a variable called I, which will start at zero. We'll create a loop while I is less than 10. And we'll just increase I by one. So this is equivalent to doing the for loop we had before, except I is now going to start at one. So we'll again check if I is equal to four, then we want to continue. And we'll again check if I is equal to eight, then we want to break. And then finally again, we'll add that element to the A list. Okay, so if we now look at the A variable, once again, number four has been skipped and number eight and higher has been skipped. So the for and while loops are working perfectly. So that is going to be the end of this episode. Don't forget to submit a vote on the poll in the previous episode on what series I should do next. Thank you to my Patreon supporter, Daniel Munch. And thank you very much for watching and I will see you all in the final episode.